This fleet equipment unscripted interview is presented by Hendrickson, a leading manufacturer of heavy-duty suspension systems and components to the global commercial transportation industry. Visit hendrickson-intl.com to learn more. Hey everyone, Jason Morgan, Content Director for Fleet Equipment. Welcome to Fleet Equipment Unscripted. We are at the Cummins headquarters in Columbus, Indiana. We're going to get a sneak peek at the Cummins X15 GHD 27 engine and after treatment system. Lots of changes here. Uh, Cummins is boasting big fuel efficiency gains uh, with the engine alone up into that three and 4% with everything engine after treatment, the, uh, the powertrain, because it has a full powertrain now, thanks to its Meritor acquisition a couple of years ago, says up to a potential 7% uh, fuel efficiency gain just from the powertrain alone. Uh, let's get a sneak peek and see what some of the changes are gonna bring. Um, if you look at overall emissions where they've halved PM emissions and we're what, 90% lower on NOx, the breather system of the engine, so think blow by gases that go by the piston and need to come out of the engine, become a very significant portion of your emissions because you have to measure those as part of your tailback emissions as well. So leaving the crankcase open, that actually becomes a significant problem. And so we have to go to closed crankcase, which means that the blow by gases are fed back into the turbocharger and go back through the engine so that everything comes out of the tailpipe and can be reduced in terms of tailpipe emissions. So that's another sort of major legislative, legislative driven change to the product. We have to go to a closed crankcase system, which means we need a more efficient breather. And so we've got a rotating breather on the side of the engine that's maintenance free now um, to meet that requirement. Sorry, I'm nope, that's good. Talking about the emissions side of it. So maybe to stay on this side, right? Um, probably everybody's already looked at it. Yeah, it's um, not there. It's not there. Cool. Um, so <laughs> our, our uh, I didn't notice that. Our 48 volt alternator would be right here. <laughs> right here. Yep. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Um, so it would be right here, and we do have uh, coolant flow to it. Um, Apologies, I thought it was still on there. This was my old show engine and it did have one on it. So um, now I'm shocked. Um, and Tom, we'll, we might add some more about when we, we've gone away from the mixer yeah, and, and the mass airflow sensor. Yeah, just one more thing on the generator. It, as Jared said, it mounts there. One of the cool things we did differently on this engine to drive the alternate is we actually put the pulley on the outside of the damper. So because we needed a fairly big drive ratio to spin that machine relatively fast, we had to have a big drive size, but we integrated it into the damper. So rather than having some kind of separate pulley or ratio system or looking at how we achieve that speed on that machine, we put the belts on the outside of the damper. So it's all integrated into the design. When the damper comes in with the other pulleys on, it now has that one as well. Um, so we end up with three belt planes with the third one on the damper to drive the um, 48 volt system. Um, yeah, Jared then started talking about the change in the air handling system. If anyone's looked really closely at how we measure flow through the engine, so thinking airflow, charge flow, those kind of things, um, we used to measure the flow of EGR in the engine with a Venturi. So it was basically a device where the flow goes through it and we're able to measure a pressure drop through that device and measure how much EGR flow we've got and then we use pressure sensors in the intake to measure how much total flow we've got into the engine. On this engine, to take away that pressure drop in the EGR system, again, from a improve efficiency and make the engine breathe better, we've taken that Venturi out and moved to an airflow sensor. So now we measure fresh air coming in from the turbocharger and then still charge flow. And that gives us an overall lower pressure drop for the sensing system we need to control the engine. So that's another change in sensor architecture that we think will make the system more reliable. The Venturi used to have to be water cooled because that sensor attached to EGR gas would overheat and so we had to water cool it. All of that's gone so we've lost all the coolant pipes, that sensor, the Venturi and everything off the engine and now we just measure with the one fresh airflow sensor on the inlet. So much simpler in terms of measurement of airflow. Okay. Yep. And then um, back on the fuel system, um, as you can see, so Tom talked through the, the pump back here. Uh, we've got our, our cartridge style uh, fuel filter. Um, and then we do have thermal recirculation valve um, to support uh, stage one and circulation of fuel to um, aid in cold starts. So that is improved design. Um, we also have an updated ECM uh, for uh, regulatory um, improvements like cybersecurity. 
change. And then, it, so just on the ECM, so another regulation change for 27 was that we now have to meet cybersecurity requirements. So um, basically, there's a document that says how ha hackable the ECM can be, um, making sure that no one can connect to it over the air through all the telematic systems we have and change anything about the way the engine operates, its emission system, and those kind of things. So the new ECM has all of that cyber security technology built into it um, from the start. So that's one of the major drivers of the new ECM. Obviously, we've also made it capable from a pin out option. So how many pins are on the ECM and those kind of things to be able to control a more complex system. So if we add CDA, variable valve timing, those kind of features in the future, the ECM is capable of driving all that new technology if we need to as well. So I think we've, we've covered most of the items on that side. Of course, we've got the, the rear gear train, uh, so that frees up some space for um, uh, service <coughs> events. Tom mentioned, uh, as we saw on the screen, uh, our new water pump module, so you can see uh, there were comments from the field that this is a good move as they no longer have to remove the damper to swap out the, the water pump module. Um, so that, that's a nice addition. We've got to maintain our VG um, turbo. And one notable difference in the EGR cooler position, uh, we have uh, moved it to the top of the manifold. Previously it was down below and had some uh, complex plumbing there. Um, but this really uh, puts it up high. It does wrap all of the fittings around the front of the engine. Um, if there were ever a, a, a service event, it's a little bit more accessible. If you've ever seen one in a truck, right, the cab's now in, encroaching up to the midpoint of the engine, um, so it puts a lot of the service items uh, readily available. So, um, yeah, again, so just on the EGR cooler, um, another one of those where we talk about it as evolution. So we've really got to the point now where EGR coolers don't fail. It's very bad we get an EGR cooler back with any kind of issue. Um, that cooler that's on the engine is exactly the same design, just a slightly different color. So we, as we integrate it into this engine, we end up with a slightly different length cooler, but fundamentally tubes, pipes, bulkheads, all the coolant flow and everything like that is all exactly the same as the previous cooler. So it's not the same part number, but fundamentally the core and everything is exactly the same. So no, that one's one where we didn't try and learn anymore, we didn't try and do anything different. It's fundamentally the same design cooler because we've already made that robust. The turbocharger is exactly the same as the previous product as well from an architecture perspective, so same actuators, same housings and those kind of things. We just changed some of the trims as we use our technology to develop more efficient wheels. Um, we can adopt those wheels into um, the new engine platforms and make the overall breathing of the engine more efficient. So nothing external changed really on the turbocharger, it's just more efficient internals. Is that a ball bearing or journal bearing turbo? Um, journal bearing. And then since we're on this side, you can see the electronic um, rotational crankcase vent back behind the shield, um, and, and then the associated plumbing with that. So I brought a couple of examples of sort of different ways we've modified the design. Um, some of these are to demonstrate the evolution of the components and how we've just made what we had better. Some of them are to show where we've done innovative things and done things different. And then I want to talk a little bit about our filter strategy as well. Um, which is why they're here. So the first thing I want to show was pistons. Um, we developed pistons over time through new technologies, new welding techniques. The piston's actually a multi-piece piston in our old engine. Um, wasn't originally, but it is now. It's all a welded assembly. Um, and that's developed, actually Jared was a big part of developing that piston when he used to work in engineering. <laughs> so um, we developed pistons over time um, for the X15 engine. But what you'll see with the new design, and this is the new piston from the 27 engine, um, is that one, we've made the bowl smaller. You heard this morning about things like changing compression ratios, improving the efficiency of combustion. That's a minor tweak to the design up here. Where you see the real difference in the piston is in the height of the piston. And what we've done is we've moved the center line of the piston pin up closer to the firing deck. And what that does is help reduce friction in the power cylinder. So the closer we can get that pin up towards the firing deck, the lower the friction is going to be in the side loading the piston. So that's why this piston is so much shorter, so much less skirt, because you don't have the same side load. But you can see it's very much an evolution. We're using all the same manufacturing technology. 
all of the same basic design of combustion, bowl and those kind of things, but in a much more compact design piston. And this is where a big chunk of that height difference of the engine came from as well. So if you think about overall stroke of the engine, but we've been able to move the piston pin up to our um, design capabilities now, you can see we could easily make the deck where the cylinder head is much lower. So that's one of the big changes internally to the new engine, is being able to modify that piston height, make the piston design much more um, simple, smaller. Did the, I do the, okay yep, on power cylinder? You did perfect. The only other side of that, <laughs> so right, the, the liner design has changed, right? Yep. We went to the high mid stop yep. um, and improved the flow velocity with the coolant uh, design changes. Um, so when you have um, areas of uh, stagnant flow, you tend to get cavitation um, and you're not taking full advantage of that flow to remove heat. So now the, the flow is focused around the top portion of the cylinder where we can really take a lot of the combustion heat out of the process. Um, and, and again, with, still with the uh, lower parasitics and then with the high mid stop, we moved to a, a press fit um, block to liner uh, interface, uh, which adds more uh, support to the liner and, and should improve our, our bore distortion, which then equates to um, oil consumption seal and then uh, of course sealing the combustion pressure. Pump on here, I think some people were probably like, why are you talking about fuel pumps? Um, as they as they walked around. Fuel pumps, um, everyone knows we had an issue back in 2010 kind of time frame with fuel pump failures and we've worked to resolve that on the current product fuel pump. So changing fuel pump, a lot of fleets will tell us they're scared of us changing fuel pump again. So just being open and honest about that. Um, what we've done is learned from all those things that we had issues with in the past on our fuel pumps and really developed um, the new fuel pump to design out those failure modes. So rather than fixing them in the existing pump, which is what we've done over multiple years, we've now designed a pump that designs out many of those failure modes. So you'll notice that rather than the pistons being just on one side of the fuel pump, we've got opposed pistons to balance some of the forces on the crank. We've taken out all of the oil lubrication from the pump. It's a fuel lubricated pump now. So no concerns about oil transfer to fuel, what that means for filter life, all those kind of things, we're literally lubricating it with the fuel now. So completely new design there. And then the whole design itself is much more compact. If you were to go look at some of the fuel pumps on some of the older engines, this opposed design means we can make the fuel pump package much smaller and shorter. And then if you look at the size of the low pressure pump on the back of there, that's also much more compact now. So just again, evolution of efficiency of pump design, um, improvements in how we design the overall architecture of the pump to go with the new engine have allowed us to really learn from some of those challenges we've had in the past and develop a much more robust fuel pump. So. Um, the other thing I wanted to show which is really around maintenance and things is the difference in um, oil filters and we've done the same on the fuel filter. So for those familiar this is the 14,000 NN NanoNet filter um, from now. I guess this, they're still branded fleet guard but it's from Atmos. Um, this is the technology we've used on our engines for pretty much all the way through the X. It's a steel canister filter and um, when you need to change oil you take this whole canister off, you throw the whole thing in the trash. Can, filter media, everything and as you drop it off the engine it's full of hot oil and really really heavy. So maintenance wise it's really not great for the environment. Um, we wanted to make improvements there but we also wanted to make serviceability easier. So the new design is this reusable plastic housing. This is the filter bit that you change. So it's just a media that pulls out the top. Um, to fix the issue of the weight of the filter when you're dropping it off the engine, we now have a drain. So you just put a hose on there, you spin this, the oil all drains out, and then I just drop the filter off the engine. And it's a much simpler service event because that thing's super light. And then we're only throwing away the carpet in the middle, which is just the nano net media basically. Oh. So yeah, big change in now we're doing filters, we're doing exactly the same on the fuel side hmm. um, in terms of filtration as well, so we'll have these on both oil and fuel on the new engine. I think you'll see a lot of like top load designs um, on other engines, we chose not to do a top load design, the challenge with those is as you service them, any debris that's on the top of there can get caught in where the filter goes, so we want to be able to drop the whole thing off clean it if you need to before you reassemble everything so that we don't get debris into the loop system. So it's a unique design in the industry but something we thought was pretty innovative in terms of how it works, how we can drain it to make it light to lift off the engine 
um, you take this whole thing off, you're not lifting a media out on the side of the engine that's full of oil, take this whole thing off and just tip the filter out into the trash, less the oil that you've already drained. Mm. So it's a pretty cool, unique yeah. feature of the new engine. So then you, you, you will be the only one supplying that kind of filter media replacement, right? Right, or are it, there it, other aftermarket that players that, that do that? It is, it is open to where aftermarket can pick it up okay. and they can begin making it. It's no, no patented design that locks uh, aftermarket out of it. Okay. So yeah, at launch, I would think it'll be ours. Yeah. Um, and then as we'll obviously use Atmos filtration on the new engines from the factory. Um, and then I'm sure the filter manufacturers will catch up and make that insert um, for our filter after the fact. Yeah, cool. <clears throat>